By the way, I wanted to start uh, with a QA. and a I get to ask the questions. Uh, I'm just wondering how many people here are local. Uh, how many are from uh, Tennessee? Raise your hand. Okay, two or three. <clears throat> Thanks. We're from uh, the middle of Texas. I'm here as a representative of the uh, Right Climate Stuff Research Team. We're a volunteer group of retired Apollo uh, NASA engineers from Houston. We're not connected in any way to James Hansen and the East Coast NASA guys. Uh, thank you. We are not, really not even connected to NASA at all because uh, this uh, was too politically involved for their association, so that's why we, uh, we have the right to use the right stuff in our name because uh, we, uh, we were part of that and still are, but uh, we're not related to NASA. We're volunteers. We're not, we, we uh, owe no one nothing. We get nothing from anybody. We're volunteers. And uh, I personally, uh, this is my third mission in life. My first mission was in the U.S. Air Force. <laughs> and, uh, during 58-62, we had a Cold War going on. No one was shooting at me. <clears throat> and my second mission was uh, the Apollo program at NASA. Thank you. And uh, we uh, managed to do that pretty well. And uh, we're, we're, this group that I'm with is 25 people, and we're challenged to uh, try to uh, uh, right a wrong uh, because we... Uh, believe that it's uh, a, a terrible imposition on the economy to uh, restrict CO2 emissions, as many of the, uh, the presentations have brought that out. We uh, are privileged to have a consensus, a, a con consensus scientist on our, on our group that works daily with our team. He's Dr. John Nielsen Gammon. Professor of Meteorology uh, at Texas A&M College, my alma mater, and uh, he's the appointed state uh, climatologist. He participates daily in email dis uh, discussions, which is the way we conduct our normal business. We have periodic meetings, and uh, we've been fortunate to have a number, three or four of the, the speakers here today, if they're in Houston, uh, we'll invite them to come out and meet with us for two or three hours, whatever spare time they have. And they've also been very supportive. Uh, we feel free to email them and ask them a question if we get something that uh, we believe that they have a better answer to than we do. Uh, no need to take notes. Uh, my presentation is uh, posted online right now. Uh, it's not on our regular uh, website. Uh, this is our website, the right, well, at the bottom, the rightclimatestuff.com. I've posted this presentation on my personal website, which is the rightstufftechnology.com. That's a consulting business that I'm starting, and I can post anything on that that I want to. The uh, full report uh, is uh, 84 pages. Uh, we have an executive summary on there, which is convenient, 13 pages. And uh, you can see this report on the rightclimatestuff.com. The lead author is Harold Dwyer, which I'll speak some more about later. Uh, and you can... Uh, if you have questions about this presentation, uh, you can contact me or Hal, either one. Uh, Hal prepared most of these, uh, these slides I'm presenting today. Uh, we'd appreciate it to keep any unvalidated opinions uh, to yourself. Our motto uh, during the Apollo program and now is in God we trust, all others bring data. My background, I uh, graduated from Texas A&M Mechanical Engineering in 1957. I uh, spent four years as a project officer uh, at uh, Kirtland in New Mexico. 
uh, research and development, and my job was to uh, was the nuclear armament on five uh, fighters and bomber aircraft, and the issue there was um, <clears throat> to make sure that the bombs didn't accidentally fall off the uh, the airplane. And believe me, it kept me busy. Uh, every uh, about every uh, the average of w once a month, I'd we'd get a call that somebody had dropped a, a practice bomb somewhere, and I'd go out there and try to figure out why it came loose from the airplane. Uh, and uh, we worked with uh, uh, nuclear safety uh, uh, organization that had been set up in the Air Force, um, and we had to explain the design of each one of these uh, <coughs> armament installations to, uh, to this group. And if there was something that we thought was wrong with it, we made a recommendation for a fix. And then uh, immediately after that, I spent the next 21 years as an aerospace engineer at NASA in, in uh, Johnson Space Center in Houston. I worked on the Apollo program, the Skylab, and the space shuttle program. The, uh, primarily in, uh, <coughs> in design, but later as the vehicle got developed, uh, I worked uh, in flight operations with the, uh, uh, during the missions. <clears throat> I mentioned already that our, we were a volunteer group formed in February 2012. Uh, we started out and still are a, an objective uh, operation. We, we included uh, both proponents and skeptics uh, to make presentations to our group and still do. Uh, the proponents are hard, hard to get to come to meet with you, other than uh, John Nelson Gammon. <clears throat> We've got the requisite uh, education and experience to do the job. Our goal is uh, objective, independent study of the uh, scientific claims of uh, man-made global warming. Our approach, uh, independent and objective and some out-of-the-box thinking. Yeah, this is an important point that uh, Hal Dryan wanted me to make is uh, climate sensitive to CO2 is really a simple statics problem. It's not a dynamics problem that requires a complicated uh, uh, computer program to run. And uh, we like simple analysis if it will work better than a, uh, than a computer analysis. And that's what the next bullet says. <coughs> Mainly uh, uh, validation of the model. If you've got a model, we used models during the Apollo program. Hal Dwyer designed some of them. I'll show you that later. But uh, they had to be validated. You had to compare them with uh, test results or some experiment that confirmed that your, your model was right on. And that's not the case with the uh, uh, climate uh, models. Did I skip two? No. Okay, last but not least, uh, we uh, depended strictly on scientific discipline, personal honesty and integrity, and a lot of stressful hard work and Probably the most important thing then and now is the personal honesty and integrity. If we uh, covered up some bad data in, in order to mislead someone to uh, take our recommendation, it, the results was someone, someone's likely to die. And uh, the, uh, I guess the climate scientists don't realize that uh, if they falsify data and convince uh, Congress to spend uh, tons and tons of money. That's not killing anybody, but a, uh, after last night's presentation, uh, I'm, I'm convinced that uh, if we waste our money on something useless, uh, it, it, people will die. Uh, the poor people in the world need uh, 
uh, cheaper energy, not cleaner energy. And hey, it's clean enough. I, I don't sound very objective now, but because we've completed the analysis and we're here to tell you that CO2 is not a significant problem. The, uh, excuse me. People say, Jim, why are you wasting your time on CO2? That's not what's causing the climate change. Well, we know that. But CO2 is the only thing we're spending a ton of money on. No one's tr spending any money trying to control uh, water vapor or the sun or the snow and ice. They hate to see the snow and ice melt. They don't realize it's going to come back. But no one, no one is trying to control that. The only thing they're trying to control is CO2. And if they were able to do it, it wouldn't do any good. If you've ever been on a, in a sailboat uh, trying to dock it, uh, and you put, you're about to hit the dock and you put the elm hard over, and the boat doesn't turn, that's because you don't have enough control authority. Okay, so changing the amount of CO2 in the air is you don't have enough control authority on the, on the uh, thing that's, that's uh, controlling the climate. Uh, I want to explain a little bit about the um, organization of, of Johnson Space Center uh, back during the Apollo days. That's the only one I remember. Uh, the, uh, I don't have any idea how they're organized now because I'm not really very admin associated with them in 30 years. Uh, we have the center director, uh, which at the time uh, I think was about 49 years old. He was the oldest guy in our, in our group. They had uh, uh, Chris Kraft in charge of flat operations. We had a guy named Tony uh, something or other. Oh, that, this is the science director. Uh, Tony was in medical. Uh, I was in the Apollo program office and we had an engineering and development uh, organization that was uh, headed by Max Faget who was one of the original guys that designed the Mercury uh, spacecraft. And uh, he had engineers there that could do engineering if we didn't like what the design was that Rockwell was uh, putting out. Uh, we would ask them to do an alternate design, put it in the shop, test it, see if it worked, and very often replaced the uh, Rockwell design. And we flew uh, the hardware that we designed there. It was a fun program for a mechanical engineer. Uh, we had the astronaut office who we invited to come to our meetings, our design reviews. Uh, we were very attentive to their opinion. And uh, in the crew training, of course, uh, the shop, okay, and down here you've got Rockwell working on the command module. That's where the three guys stay when they're going to the moon and Grumman, the lunar module, the part that goes down and lands. And of course, KSC was the launch site and Marshall Space Flight Center uh, were the guys that designed the booster, Werner von Braun and, and a bunch of his cronies. During the mission, we had uh, uh, Chris Kraft's bunch uh, of uh, young guys, a lot of them uh, pilots, uh, but they, they had uh, stations in the control room, uh, depending on what subsystem, the electronics guys and the guys that are worried about the life support, uh, trajectory analysis and all these guys, uh, they had like one guy in the control room that the flight director could <coughs> uh, keep an eye on and ask him questions directly. And they had back rooms that they had three or four guys <coughs> that uh, were experts that studied up on their subsystem and were ready to give an immediate answer uh, to their counterpart in the control room. Uh, immediate, sometimes you've got 15 minutes, sometimes you've got two hours, sometimes you've got about two or three minutes. <clears throat> I worked in this, during missions, I worked on a team in the uh, spacecraft analysis room and uh, our 
primary uh, workflow was with uh, the missions evaluation room where we had a few hundred engineers uh, that uh, had been working on the design of, the, of each of the subsystems in detail with their uh, uh, contractor counterparts. And uh, this line here means that the, if the mission control wanted to know anything about the performance of uh, the system, it was usually something there, can we exceed the design requirements because they already had the book on what the equipment could do. Uh, and they operated within those limits. If they needed to go out of the limits, uh, they would ask us a question. We'd get a, a for sure answer here and uh, feed it back. This is why we were able to uh, <coughs> successfully bring the, <coughs> the guys back on Apollo 13. Because we uh, uh, started out, we didn't, <coughs> I, I, excuse me, I've got to get a, Another sip of my coffee. My mouth is dry enough. You know, I start talking about 13 and whew. We didn't have enough power or, or water to complete the mission for those guys to get back. And we had to turn everything off that we could. There still wasn't enough power saved. We had to turn some things off that we shouldn't alter, like the navigation system. And uh, I got to I got to skip over this. <laughs> I'll talk to you about it later. My design responsibility for the first five years was uh, the docking system, which is the mechanism that fits on the front of the command module and hooks it to the lunar module. And uh, uh, if if that doesn't work at the beginning of the mission, you scrub the mission. If it doesn't work when the crew comes back. To orbit after their mission on the, you're, you're in hell of a mess. Uh, you, hopefully, we didn't really have any design way for them to crawl out of the moon and struggle over the command module like you see in the movies. Uh, but uh, it was something that had to work, and I was fortunate to get in on that at the beginning and establish the design criteria. And uh, I, I've got a really nice story to tell you about that if we have time later. Then the uh, the hatch. It turned out that we started with the wrong design philosophy. Uh, the windows, this is uh, my personal little pat on the back I give myself because uh, I singularly found a flaw in uh, the design. The whole mechanism that opened these window covers and closed them was a total mess. I knew it wasn't going to work. The, uh, but I was able to get the change made uh, without bothering the schedule. The crew couch and attenuation struts were uh, something used if you aborted and landed on land for water landings, they weren't necessary. Water landing was a pretty rough problem because the uh, vehicle wasn't designed for water landing, it was designed for all of the flight loads, reentry into the atmosphere. And we knew that it was going to break when we dropped it, so we gave a very gentle test condition, something you'd see. Uh, normally on the, on the Pacific Ocean. And when it hit the water, it, it knocked a hole in the bottom and it sank in two and a half minutes. So we immediately started a massive redesign for the bottom of the spacecraft. The, uh, then some other small things, but the story here is that everything except the docking system had to be redesigned because the original design that uh, Rockwell had, there were a bunch of good engineers out there, but they, they didn't have the, the foresight of the engineers that we had in Houston, uh, and uh, we had to redesign almost everything. This is a picture of the command module in lunar orbit. Uh, this is what you would see if the lunar module was uh, either had just undocked from the command module or it uh, was in the process of redocking. This is the docking mechanism here, and uh, the ceiling ring, and the five windows that I was talking about. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about Hal, because he's the, uh, as I say, the lead author on the paper we wrote on this analysis. And uh, we have a unique analysis. Uh, we didn't use a computer model at all. 
uh, because we, well, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll just tell you that, that uh, we, we, have, we think we have a unique analysis and we're looking for uh, comments and inputs, not necessarily today, but uh, uh, we're, we're interested in, if someone can find something wrong with this thing, we, we need to know about it and fix it. And uh, the, uh, it's been out since February and we haven't had any, anyone offer any uh, criticism on it. <clears throat> but uh, during the uh, Apollo program, uh, Hal, uh, well, I knew I was gonna do this eventually. Use a better finger. All thumbs. Oh, pushing the wrong button, they're on the red button. Yeah, this is, this is some charts on, uh, on the cost. I'm not gonna go over those. Uh, th I mentioned this, but uh, they're, in the, they're on the website. Uh, you, can, you can go to this stuff and read these charts. And uh, here's where my cost data. I noticed my data is different from uh, Ken Hapless data by a factor of two. We'll repost uh, the, the story here was uh, we're spending a billion dollars a month, uh, but it's really two billion. So we'll, we'll start that out. But I think cost is important. Okay, I need to back up. Right here. Now the red button, all right. Hal's uh, model predicted the limb tip over conditions. In other words, when the lunar module was coming down, it's got four legs sticking down here. When it hits the ground, if it's at an angle, it's gonna kinda rock and try to tip over. Or it can land on a, on a rock, one foot pad, and it'll try to tip over whichever way it, you know. So that's bad. If it tips over, you just lost the crew, period. Uh, the, uh, he, he worked out a model that would simulate the dynamics of the thing laying on the moon. And the critical thing was he had to uh, determine when to, when to turn the engine off. If you land with an engine, it's pressurized, it's, it's, the force is actually building up more due to the ground effect or the moon effect. Um, it, if you're tipping, it's gonna try to help you tip over. So we had a probe six feet long. On the bottom there was a sensor that turned the light on in the cockpit. And when the light turned on, that told the uh, commander that he was six feet off of the deck and it was time to cut the engine. And, he, and if he did that, he helped his chance of not turning over. <clears throat> the, uh, of course, this, you can see how critical this model is. <clears throat> and the uh, other one had to do with Pogo, which I'll show you a little uh, uh, cartoon to explain it to you if you don't know what Pogo is. But uh, the, the main deal, we had Pogo problems on all the manned space flight. Uh, especially Apollo 13, that's the other failure that no one knows about. Everyone says, gee whiz, they were lost and couldn't come home. During launch, they had this pogo vibration mode start, and they were, it was an 18 hertz cycle, and they were within one cycle of the engine failing the structure and going through the hydrogen tank and destroying the vehicle during launch. And unfortunately, there was a, a low fuel level sensor that got tripped. Wasn't necessarily supposed to respond to this. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'll take your advice, Joe. The, um, I just have a scratchy throat till at least 12 or one o'clock. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, I lost my place. What was I talking about? Anybody awake? Pogo, yeah. Yeah, the low fuel level light turned the engine off and saved the whole mission of the crew uh, because it shut off that engine that was going like this. Maybe God was taking care of us that day. Uh, yeah, uh, Jay, can, Jeremy, can you play the, the video now? Mm -hmm. 
okay, you got a launch vehicle over here and you got a, a big hydrogen tank and a smaller oxygen tank. It's sending uh, liquid fuel down the uh, standpipe to the engines. And uh, you've got, uh, you simulate the masses. He's just shown a couple of masses. You've got hundreds of mass elements and uh, spring elements, damper elements. And, um, the, the, but, but the deal is, over here in the standpipe, it's, it's not just flowing in a nice flow. It's actually jumping around as, it's, it's, uh, as the engine thrusts. It's, does, it's not a regular burn, and it causes the fuel to oscillate, which comes down and, and puts a variable pressure on the engine, makes it more irregular. And that's what induces a structural oscillation mode. And uh, the, uh, uh, normally in, a, in, in Apollo and some of the other missions, uh, it was uh, just noticeable. It didn't look like it was going to get out of hand. And uh, we got all the way up to Apollo 13 uh, fl flying with, with this situation. They didn't have any damper or anything in the system to keep it from happening. They were just watching it. And it got out of hand on Apollo 13, so they got serious about it. Um, and then for the, uh, you can cut this off if you will. <clears throat> for the shuttle, the manager of the shuttle program walked into Al Dwyer's office, told him to design a shuttle damper system that would, uh, so that there wouldn't be any shuttle, uh, pogo, what did it say? a pogo damper system that would keep the shuttle from having any, any this vibration mode whatsoever. He designed it and it worked perfectly. So uh, I'm not taking any uh, challenges that uh, the, a bunch of old Apollo uh, rocket engineers don't have the capability to go through this uh, climate, climate science. So with that, the, uh, I'm going to have to rush through this. I think I'm sure of time, and I want to save some time for questions. Uh, climate, is, as everyone knows, is a very complex system. You've got the sun, uh, land, uh, oceans, snow and ice, clouds, volcanoes, human activity down here pumping out, uh, burning the fossil fuels. And uh, this is too much uh, for anyone to uh, understand uh, how, how this works now. Uh, the, uh, we uh, chose to just study CO2 because that's the only thing that uh, is, is a problem, and the only problem is a political problem. It's not a scientific problem. Um, it's the same thing. Um, this is the cost deal. The deal. Uh, and here, I'll say, so we, we wanted to base our analysis on real data. And uh, some of the data we looked at was the, uh, this is the Greenland ice core data. And you notice for uh, uh, up to the last uh, 10,000 years ago, uh, this was the uh, last ice age. And uh, there was extreme variations in temperature. The last 10,000 years, it's been very well under control. You'd say, gee whiz, we don't have to do anything. Well, we... Uh, that's almost true. The uh, uh, current climate models are not validated. This is my favorite uh, chart that I've seen in several forums. This is the one that John Christie gave to in testimony to Congress in December 2013. And it shows uh, 102 of the models and what, how they predict the uh, uh, temperature will change according to the standard uh, rise in uh, CO2 level measured in Mauna Loa. And uh, here are the actual temperatures that we've seen since about 1978, I think. Uh, balloon and, uh, and satellite data. Uh, and uh, th this is where all the models are. And uh, you know, if you're designing an aerospace vehicle or an airplane or that uh, has a, a model analysis like that, you, you don't use it. You, you just guess if you have to, but you don't use this model. Ah, Richard Feynman. 
doesn't matter how beautiful your theory is, it doesn't matter how smart you are, if it doesn't agree with the experiment, it's wrong. No one's disproved that. Uh, seems clear to me how can EPA and Congress ignore the data. Uh, this, this is the strongest data I've seen that says it's, it's, it's a nonsense to base your decisions on bad science. Okay, here's my idea of the IPCC building. I think it's beautiful. Okay, the uh, specific data, we just looked at uh, two or three things here. We only have three elements in our analysis. One is the fact that we have a, a thousand, we, we see that over a period of 2,000 years, we, the last 2,000 years, we have a, a, a thousand year cycle that we see. We don't really care what caused it. All we know, want to know is, is this, this was, is this data good and, and uh, are we understanding it correctly? The, uh, other data we looked at was the data back to 1850 where we started burning fossil fuels. And uh, these are uh, from the Had Crud 4 uh, data. There's a little bit wrong with almost all the data in the world. We think there's less things wrong with this data and that's why we used it. But uh, this is the distribution of global uh, average temperatures and we see there's a 62 cycle, 62 year cycle in this data. So uh, just to say something about CO2 level, uh, plant, the plant growth requirement is 150 parts per million. I didn't realize we were that close to the limit of plants not growing. Uh, and uh, it started about 250 years, two, 250 parts per million uh, back at, in 1800, and, uh, and it's doubled up here to this dotted line uh, already. I think we're, we're past doubling, the original doubling. And then this is the limit for the NASA space uh, station for space uh, craft flights. 500 parts per million is fine. Navy subs, 8,000 parts per million. So uh, it is, as concerning about CO2 as a gas, it's, it's way down here almost uh, uh, too low. The uh, data that we put in the analysis uh, is from the, uh, the law dome data that goes back uh, that far. This is uh, East Antarctica uh, core. And uh, fortunately it has a little overlap in the data they took. It overlaps the beginning of the Mauna Loa data and they are right on top of each other which confirms both sets of data. Uh, and so we have good data up to right now. And this part here is a projection. And uh, I was talking to the group at dinner last night and asked the question, what do you think, when are we gonna run out of fossil fuels? And everyone said two to 300 years, in, in, including uh, Marita, who, who uh, that's, that's her main study is, you know, what's gonna happen with fossil fuels. Uh, so we, uh, from the uh, estimates made by EIA, which is the Energy Information Administration, I'm always hesitant to use government information, but su supposedly th this is, uh, uh, is accepted by industry. The, uh, uh, we feel that around 2050, uh, fossil fuels are begun to be scarce, more expensive. People are gonna start looking for and developing alternate uh, uh, sources of energy and so therefore this curve will taper down a little bit and by 600 uh, and by the time it reaches 600 parts per million it'll uh, it'll, it'll be flattened out and, and start to descend because we'll be totally on alternative energy now if what they're telling me last night which we'll implement into the study uh, is true then you see that this will continue on this part of the curve and go up to perhaps 800 or 1,000 parts per million. Uh, we'll do the analysis on that and get the numbers, but it's gonna be about two degrees centigrade. So that's still not uh, in the problem area. These are our three functions, the 1,000 year cycle, the 62 year cycle, 
and the CO2. This formula is accepted by both uh, sides of the argument, uh, the skeptics and the proponents. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to read this definition. I've drawn some clever pictures which get the message over. There are three uh, games here. The ECS forcing function is what's used in the climate models. And the way they do that, if they want to study doubling CO2, they double it the first year and put this in and leave it on for a thousand years in order to get the long-term feedback into the model. Uh, this is a little better. They also use this, uh, but they're assuming that uh, CO2 goes up 1% every year. Uh, we uh, see there's better data. We can use the real stuff and put that in the, into our formula and use it. We don't have to use something that's fabricated. The uh, ECS and TCR are actually derived from the climate models. Uh, the TCS is uh, derived from the actual climate data. TCR happens to be about equal to TCS. As far as ECS is concerned, just forget about it. This is the analysis, and while you memorize these numbers, I'm going to take another sip from Joe Bass's glass. I'm not as much of a, you know, I'm just barely made through mechanical engineering. I'm not a mathematician, but I wrote this program myself on Excel. Um, it's very, it's just, I'm not even, it's not math, it's arithmetic. <clears throat> but uh, you, these are the inputs, the, uh, the concentration at the beginning of the time you're studying, and then the concentration each year. And uh, this goes from Law Dome data to Mauna Loa data, and then projection for 2050 and 2100. These numbers could change, but we picked a TCS value of 1.5, and uh, it uh, gives you uh, these uh, increases in temperature, and uh, the maximum temperature at 2100 is about a, a degree and a half centigrade. <clears throat> but uh, I'm gonna, I'm, this was available on the internet to you, and uh, you can send me an email if you have a problem setting it up on your computer. The, uh, let's see, I skipped. Uh, It was supposed to have another slide, but I guess it got lost in the shuffle. But the other slide I actually put down this morning, uh, the calculation for uh, uh, 800 parts per million and 1,000 parts per million. So you can just copy this formula down and, and plug in any, if you wonder what the temperature rise would be for 3,000 parts per million, you just put it in and it tells you what the temperature change is. Okay, now what we do with this curve we generate from the three elements is it draws this dotted line. Here's all of our data, and uh, the uh, we the deal is you just make just make sure that this line just hits all the peaks. And uh, for a TCS value of 1.5, this is leaving the thousand-year cycle out. I've got another one that has it in. Uh, we get about one degree uh, increase in temperature. This is with the thousand year climate cycle, which I think is the most realistic one. Uh, and it gives you uh, a, a much easier TCS. It's, it's 0.8. That's low in today's discussions. Uh, but uh, the nice thing about it is in 2020, you see our curve we'll have data there, and if our data is where the star is, that means this thing works. And I uh, hope it does. I hope I'm still around in six years. The, um, but uh, either curve uh, is more or less the same. What this is saying is the temperatures are, are if it follows this, they're gonna be horizontal, they're gonna be pretty well all the way out to maybe 2030, we may not have any sensible temperature rise. It'll be interesting to see. The, uh, 
This is, uh, we were just taking a look at the most conservative TCS value and it turned out to be a, a 1.8. Same thing, you just want to make sure you've got a curve that includes all the data. Okay, this is uh, how we predict the future. This is the, uh, temp the CO2 uh, projection that peaks out at uh, 600 parts per million. And here's the, uh, the, the temperature increase that uh, it should cause. And uh, this is less than 1.2. As I say, if, you, if it keeps on going way on up here and gets up here with this and flattens out up here, it's probably going to be a couple of degrees. OK, here's my chart. This, I put in Charney, who started this uh, uh, one and a half degree thing. Uh, 1.5 to 4.5, and uh, you would need 766 parts per million to, uh, to do that. And uh, to get to 450, you'd have to have 2,800 parts per million. Uh, Alex Dessler, another prof down at Texas A&M, uh, his low number uh, is, uh, would would need 1,100 parts per million and his high number of 4.8. 4 his low number is 2.4 and high number is 4.8. He would need 3,200 parts per million. So I, my judgment is that Dr. Dessler is a little bit too far out. It's too bad he's associated with Texas A&M. Okay, you can read these conclusions. They're important, uh, basically. They say uh, our numbers are 0.8 to 1.8 on the CO2 sensitivity, and the IPC numbers are, after 35 years, are 1.5 to 4.5. I got to pat myself on the back for being part of a group that, in two years, has come up with this analysis, which is easy to do on a, just a simple computer. And these guys haven't made any progress in 35 years. They're still their best answers. Uh, we say things like computer models need to be validated, uh, the government's overreacting. Uh, basically, uh, I'll skip this slide here. Uh, this is what we're going to continue to do. We're going to continue to work on the problem, the uh, uh, whole workshops and entertain traveling uh, speakers. Uh, this is the main thrust right here is provide comments to the regulatory agencies during public comments period. Our uh, chairman, Hal Ryan, is home right now working out his testimony to give uh, in a lawsuit against the EPA. We're gonna continue to try to uh, educate the public and uh, I'm gonna try to follow the advice that Marita gave you earlier. I think she'd be all the public relations for our, uh, our team. This uh, more Feynman advice for a successful technology reality must take precedence over public relations, for nature cannot be fooled. Here again is the report. I encourage you to look at it, ask questions. And there is the picture of our Earth as, as it's rising over the horizon of the, of the lunar surface. So with that, we're ready for questions. Thank you. No questions? I'll go back and talk about the fun stuff. We'll interrupt the front stuff if you think of a question. Oops. Where are you getting your funding? Uh, we're a volunteer. We have no funding. We pay, we pay our expenses out of our pocket. That's, uh, well, we'd like to invite you guys to come down and speak to us, educate us. Dr. Singer's made a couple of trips down there and, uh, and some others uh, really soon. And, uh, but uh, they, they just tagged us on to one of the trips or, that someone else is paying for. Okay, uh, the story on the docking system. How much time have we got left? Let's see you have uh, five minutes. 
Five minutes? Twelve minutes. minutes. Wonderful. Two stories. Uh, I got a call from the, my designer over in Rockwell uh, in the dynamics design area. He says, uh, hey, you need to give us the docking criteria for the docking system. I, I'd been there about three months at NASA. And I said, um, hmm, docking criteria. Well, exactly what do you mean? What do you need? He says, you know, closure rate, miss distance, angular velocity at impact, and, you know, design criteria. I said, okay, I'll do that. So I put down the phone and our normal mode was to call our guys over in engineering development uh, because they were, they were building the hardware. I called up Don Cheatham, who was head of the division that designed the uh, navigation and control system for Apollo. His uh, group monitored the contract. He had a subsystem. Uh, they had a contractor build it, of course. And so I said, Don, I need to know how accurately you can handle this vehicle when it's docking. What's the dead limits of the, of the reaction control system? He said, Jim, I can't tell you. And I says, Don, I, we've got to design the docking hardware. And he says, Jim, I can't tell you because we just let the contract. We have no idea what the performance of the system's going to be. <laughs> so I said, gee whiz. So I call up my old uh, friend uh, that was working in the Gemini project office. And I said, uh, hey, do you, uh, do you know what the docking criteria for the Gemini was? And he says, no, but uh, Carl McDonald, uh, this, call this guy here, he'll, he'll probably know. So I call him and uh, I say, gee whiz, we, that was way back in the early design days at Gemini. We don't know. We, the people that worked on that, are, I don't even know where they are in the plant. I says, holy mackerel. <laughs> so, I, uh, it was about lunchtime, and in those days I brought a sandwich and a brown bag, and uh, I, there happened to be a, an Aviation Week uh, a magazine laying on a desk. Everybody else was gone for lunch, and I just picked it up, and well, at first I noticed on the cover it had a picture of a Gemini spacecraft, and it said something about docking, so I turned over there and you know, I used to, when I was a kid, I used to read this magazine because I was interested in airplanes. And they made their money by finding out something pretty secret about Air Force airplanes and putting it in their magazine. And uh, that's how they got readers. And they, along the lines of uh, uh, spacecraft, they did the same thing. And they had, they had the docking criteria <laughs> there and before my eyes. Maybe the man upstairs was working on that too. But uh, they had like a half a foot per second closure rate and I figured we had a, a vehicle that was 10 times bigger and heavier and I ought to make that one foot per second. They had a missed distance of 30 of a, a foot. I says, well, I have to use that because our tunnel's only 30 inches in diameter so a one foot missed distance would work pretty good. And the angular velocities and everything were there. So I called the back guy back and said, uh, okay, here's your docking criteria. And I didn't consult anybody. Uh, there was no one to consult. Uh, the people in the in Gemini were the peop only people with experience with docking in space. So I, I used judgment, it turned out to be good, it worked perfectly, except for Apollo 14. Uh, during the initial docking procedure, for some reason, we didn't get an initial latch. The way the thing worked was very reliable, the most reliable. Instead of trying to connect two tunnels together like this, we had a probe and cone so that uh, this, the, the docking mechanism had a, a little uh, pointed uh, ball on the end, and it would, the lunar module was over here. And if it missed, it would just slide down until it got to the hole and connect some little latches about the size of my thumb. And then from that, they would retract it, get the seal latched, and, uh, and depressurize it and have a tunnel to go back and forth. But that's how the uh, docking system uh, got uh, designed. How much time I got? Uh, let's see, about maybe five minutes. Perfect. Okay, uh, the window change. Uh, I mentioned during uh, in the Air Force, 
I had uh, my main job was to understand mechanical link linkages that connected to the bottom of the airplane, and I spent a fair amount of time trying to figure out why some of them didn't work. So when I saw the drawing, the, what we had in Apollo is we had five window covers on the windows, and one cover over the astro sextant door, which was a telescope on the bottom of the spacecraft that they could take star sightings and realign their navigation system. So the uh, window cover mechanism, it had a little crank that you cranked on and it had a, a gear and a four bar uh, linkage that uh, made, uh, made, went through the pressure wall and the heat shield and, and, and made the window covers move away from the windows. And the same thing when you entered, you closed all of those covers. If one of them didn't work, you were gonna die that day because the, 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 the fire, the, you know, the uh, reentry into the atmosphere would burn through the windows and uh, that would be the end of that game. So uh, I called up the Rockwell guy and I said, uh, why didn't you put heat, heat resistant glass in here and, and uh, you know, it worked better. And he said, well, when we released the design, uh, we couldn't get glass that could handle the heat. And uh, I says, well, what, what about now? Can you get glass that'll take it? He says, yeah. I says, okay, take the window covers off and put the glass in. So he says, you'll have to give me a contract directive. I says, I'll be happy to do that. So in those days, we sent essentially a, an email. We called it a Twix, TWX. And uh, I just wrote the thing out, had the secretary type it. At, uh, you know, it was this size right here. Had my boss, uh, approve it, he didn't even ask me a question about it, and sent it to them, and they took the window covers off and redesigned it. Except that, you know, was, was I unnecessarily concerned about it? Well, on the other side is this sextant, uh, astral sextant door with the cover, and that's the hot side, and they didn't have glass that would work. So they had to keep the window cover, and I says, well, it's better to have one catastrophic failure point than six, so we went with that. During the qualification testing of the, of the linkage, they couldn't make it work in the lab on the ground with six technicians around. So they had to scrap that idea and come up with some out-of-the-box thinking to give the hole that we had in the wall a protection. And by then, I was off of design, and I, I don't really know how the thing worked, but, but it did work, and it didn't have a window cover. So uh, we, that, I just tell you that, I'm not bragging about myself, I'm saying this was daily business. We did this stuff all day long, everybody did it, and you'd, you'd, we were flying into an unknown area with unknown uh, uh, designs, uh, and uh, it, was, it was a challenge, but at the end of every day we felt like they were pretty confident in the decisions we had made. And we, it worked pretty good. Questions? No, we're faced with questions. Time for the next pitch. <laughs>